Well, welcome to our fourth session. And this week we're going to be exploring the research processes involved around futures predictions. Now, we're going to examine three main aspects. The processes of making predictions based upon trends, the establishment of forecasts, and the concept of creating backcasts. So there are a number of processes we use in making predictions about the future that are research based. Now they're not science fiction as we've talked about previously. They're fundamentally based upon established trends that we have data to support. So this week we're going to look at a number of prediction based reports that have explored what is likely to occur in educational technologies. And we're going to look at some of these reports and some of the findings and get a better understanding of the nature of what these predictive processes and predictive research can inform us in terms of our educational practice with, it, with technology and also where we can conduct research utilizing these approaches to better understand the potential and opportunities that are emerging around educational technologies. So the first report that we're looking at is the Driving K-12 Innovation. Now this was developed to explore what is occurring in higher education and in K-12. We're going to be focusing on, in this one, on the K-12 report. And it identifies a, a range of different elements around educational technologies. So not just the technologies themselves, but also the challenges and the opportunities that are emerging that are associated with these technologies. So first off, there are what's called the hurdles, which represent the challenges. The accelerators, which are the opportunities that have emerged as a result of the technology. And then the technology enablers that enable um, educational organizations to enhance what they do as a result of educational technologies. So first off, let's look at the hurdles. Now there was a whole range of different hurdles explored, not just the ones that are reported. First thing you need to understand about these reports is that they examine a wide range of educational technologies, the challenges involved and the opportunities involved. And they utilize what's called a Delphi process to rank these different elements of forecasting and to make decisions as to which are the most important aspects. And these tend to be the ones that are then reported, the top six, the top three, however many are uh, decided upon. But the actual body of research that's explored might involve a hundred different um, possibilities. So these are some of the ones that are explored in this particular report. Um, in inadequate resourcing, uh, the organizational culture in educational organizations, the pedagogy versus technology gap. So lots and lots of um, different possible elements. And from these then a decision is made as to which are going to be the most significant, in this case over the next five years. So first challenge for you to respond to in to the Teams challenge and Teams channel is what do you think are the greatest challenges facing education? Now you can utilize these lists and have a look at some of the possibilities and make a selection from those, or you may have your own challenges that you feel are facing education and that are more important to be considered when looking at what's occurring in um, education today. Now these lists were developed before the pandemic. So that has obviously had an impact upon how we interpret some of the challenges and opportunities around educational technology. So the top five hurdles that were identified in 2020 were these. Well, I see we list the top six, but let's go for six then. Um, scaling and sustaining innovation has been consistently a significant challenge for many, many years in educational technology. 
yes, we come up with great ideas and we think that they'll have a big impact, but actually having them occur beyond a few lighthouse institutions and schools is surprisingly difficult. Actually having them become systematized and used across a nation or a country or state um, has proven much more challenging than originally anticipated. So that's an ongoing challenge around educational technologies. Data privacy and ownership is an increasing challenge. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about that. The evolution of teaching and learning, how the nature of, of how we go about teaching is changing. It's not as much focused around teacher-centered um, lecture style to much more interactive um, student focused and initiated um, learning experiences. Digital equity remains a challenge. Uh, there's various groups in our society that don't have as much access to educational technology and to learning as others. And that remains an ongoing cause of concern. And the nature of work is changing. So not just within schools is educational technology and technology in general having a big impact, but outside of education. Um, and as one of the purposes of education is prepare students for the future of work, that needs to be considered as we look at what's important within education. So these challenges are then looked at in terms of how difficult they are to overcome and ranked and so forth. And so the experts get together and decisions are made as to which are the most significant, which are going to be the most challenging and so forth. Now then the experts also tend to be drawn from educational organizations and schools and universities and so forth. And so a consideration was also made as to what was the challenges being faced personally by the various experts. Because it's fine to say what we feel is a challenge globally or nationally, but what are the actual challenges facing ourselves? That can also be very informative as to the overall um, landscape of the research around educational technologies. So again, these were the major issues, but they were somewhat different. Pedagogy versus technology was the, the most significant now, where teacher practice teachers how they go about teaching was not necessarily utilizing the advances available in educational technologies. There was a considerable gap between what technology could achieve and what teachers and educators were use, utilizing and teaching in their organizations. Equity was a more significant issue, but one that wasn't as a global issue, but very much a local issue was that around ongoing professional development and the need to, to upskill and train our teaching workforce to be able to utilize educational technologies in a significant way. Then we had sustaining and um, scaling innovation, data privacy, and the evolution of teaching and learning again. But it was a different focus when we looked at things locally as to when we considered things globally. So scaling and sustaining innovation has been an ongoing challenge for many, many years. And schools are looking at ways of, of use, using technology to value add their core business, which is teaching and learning. Um, but it's an ongoing challenge. Data ownership and privacy is again increasingly complex and becoming more and more complex, particularly in the European countries where specific rules around data ownership and privacy are leading the way globally. Um, in other countries, particularly in East Asia, there is more control being exerted around data ownership and privacy by governments in particular. Uh, while in um, US and Australia, um, very much data ownership and privacy is favoring big business and they're more driving the processes around uh, what's occurring around data. But it's an interesting landscape, and particularly as we're seeing the power of 
um, the European Union to influence global attitudes towards data and privacy, um, we're going to see more and more of that happening in education. Um, the EU has brought out a charter of, of rights around data and privacy. And as that's being applied to students, um, it opens up a whole can of worms around what is acceptable use of student data and students' right for privacy. Now, you may think that that's all very well and good. We don't want big business coming in and having influences over students in terms of what data they can access and so forth. But it also has an impact upon the data that's collected by educators. We collect a lot of data on students and not all of it done particularly ethically. And there is considerable debate happening about whether or not students need to be much more firmly protected from educational organisations. Of course, not all the data that we collect is inherently in to the benefit of individual students. A test result, for example, if it's not particularly favourable to that student, is not particularly beneficial if that's then recorded and used later for various purposes, not necessarily approved of by the student or by their parents. So that just opens up a whole range of issues. Now, of course, there needs to be consideration as to what's necessary for teaching and learning to occur efficiently and effectively. And that's the counterbalancing forces. But it's just a way of indicating that in education, we often have one perspective on certain things, while other perspectives do exist in the community. And that's certainly one of them around data and privacy. Um, the evolution of teaching and learning is also ongoing, and that's having a significant impact, um, primarily in upskilling our teachers. Um, teaching is a very busy profession, and having the time and energy and resources to invest in upskilling and professional development um, for many is difficult. And particularly with the, the pace of change around technologies and educational technologies, many of our educators and our educational systems are not coping well in maintaining um, advances, particularly around pedagogical opportunities. Then we have the, the pedagogy versus technology gap, where again, it's it's the educator's understanding of how the technology can be used. Now, some of that is around their professional knowledge and, and engagement, but some of it is also simply around a disjunct between the pedagogies that they wish to teach with and those that are now available and potentially have opportunities. So having teachers have an open mind around educational technologies and the pedagogies that they can support uh, can be an important factor around bridging the technology pedagogy gap. But it's again, a significant issue in educational technologies. Digital equity has been around with us for a long, long time. Um, and in some respects it's improving, but in others it's not. Um, but at least we're acknowledging it more and more and trying to address the issues around ensuring that all of our students have opportunities to learn effectively. And also all of our teachers have opportunities to engage with technology to teach effectively. Um, because that's not always equitable in various systems and countries and so forth. So these are all issues that are, need to be considered around digital equity. Then we have accelerators. So they were the major hurdles that were identified. There were 50 or so hurdles um, considered, and those were the top six that were considered most significant over the next five years. But there was also some opportunities that were identified. Again, there were many considered, um, looking at computational thinking, immersive learning, uh, exemplary user experiences, um, open educational resource adoption, personalization, educational technologies, school choices, 
whole range of different um, potential accelerators to enhancing um, education and generally through technology. So from these, think about what you think are the greatest opportunities for education to advance, to improve. So of all the different things that might be possible to be achieved, what do you think are the ones that would give us the greatest impetus for change and innovation and improvement? And put those into teams. So the ones identified uh, for 2020 were the following. Uh, learners as creators, data-driven practices, personalization, social and emotional learning, building the human capacity of leaders, and learner autonomy. So in terms of the intensity of these, so which are the ones that were most significant? They were rated generally relatively consistently, but learners of creators was identified as probably the, the one that would see the biggest bang for buck, the biggest change, the thing that would influence things the most if we invested most around that particular accelerator. Now again, the advisory board was asked to explore what were the greatest accelerators for their own personal experiences in their own educational organizations. And here it was again a little bit different. Social and emotional learning was considered the main um, accelerator. That if more effort was to go into improving the social and emotional capacity of their students, that would have the most significant change. So it wasn't considered the most significant globally, but for their own individual organizations, that was certainly the most significant one. The next one wasn't on the big picture radar, but it was around collaborative learning, having students upskilled and better prepared to work in teams and collaboratively on tasks, but also teachers working collaboratively um, was considered a very significant um, accelerator. Then we again had learners as creators as a significant aspect, data-driven practices also significant, and then personalization being the idea that we need to individualize instruction and have personal learning pathways and journeys for students rather than mass instruction. So again, just quickly summarizing, learners as creators was particularly having that focus again on student-centered learning but we're taking students' ideas and letting them create with those ideas, be it through project-based learning or other uh, approaches, um, was seen as a significant driver for educational innovation. Data-driven practices, most organizations are seeing a big push around this, um, primarily institutionalized, where it's the institution that's driving the use of the data and the data is generally being used more for administrative processes rather than educational processes but there's certainly the potential for more focus around data informing um, curriculum decisions uh, the hiring of different staff um, and then teaching and learning and investment in technology so a lot has to do with the investment of where emphasis is being placed and so that needs to be informed by data or from a researcher, we would say informed by research. Um, but rather than just personal opinions or fads, having firm data that supports decision making. And that buys in well into the whole futurist, uh, futurism research based agenda, where we look at what can be done, what might happen based upon solid or at least reasonably solid uh, trends and evidence that things may most likely occur as the data is suggesting rather than just going off on gut decisions or uh, particular leadership initiatives and things of that nature that don't have a firm basis in the data. And personalization has been around for a long, long time um, since the very in initial stages of computing where we had computer based instruction. 
Um, it's never really been fully realized, but more and more effort is going into it. Uh, we have big initiatives around things like Khan Academy and um, a lot of online video being produced that allows different uh, materials to be tailored for different students. So there's more and more um, interest being placed in this again. And we also have drivers coming from artificial intelligence, which can make a whole range of decisions um, for each individual student, where in the past, the complexity and the time constraints around those decisions meant that it wasn't able to be personalized for individual students. We can now utilize AI-based technologies to support those decision-making processes and help with the individualization. So we have increases in resources um, in terms of learning activities, particularly around video-based and online instructional-based um, learning activities. And we have increased capacity for choices around which of those learning activities can be best tailored for individual students. And so that's again reinvigorating the interest in um, individualization. And the social and emotional learning, which was the focus of um, the, uh, the, the panel when they looked at things from an individual perspective, was very much around this um, relatively new ideas around uh, emotional quotient um, being equivalent to um, intellectual or intelligence quotients. And the idea that we can um, make measurements of students' um, emotional uh, skills and then teach and change those their capacity about being resilient, about being able to um, respond to challenges, to face risks, um, and a whole range of things around those processes. So not so much focused around educational technologies in this case, but as we've also used a lot of technology to support behavioral management plans in schools, um, they've been very much tied into those aspects. Of course, the behavioral management plans were by their nature individualized um, and involved a fair bit of record keeping and were digitized. And so a lot of the social and emotional um, aspects are also being added on to those behavioral management aspects, um, which is leading into their digitization. Um, so it's more a record keeping process at the moment, but as we're seeing with individualization in teaching and learning, as AI and learning activities are developed to support students' um, social and emotional development, then we'll see more and more opportunities to individualize those processes and technology may assist greatly in that. And the final one from this set of accelerators was building the human capacity of our leadership. Now, leaders have often been considered a bottleneck in innovation. Now, ideally, we'd love to see leaders as um, leading innovation and enhancing it. Um, but unfortunately, education is an inherently conservative industry, um, and the leadership also tends to be relatively conservative and risk averse um, as they develop out of the industry. Um, so to date, educational leaders haven't been particularly innovative um, as we would see in many other industries. The tech industry is probably the highlight, but there's many other industries that do tend to be more innovative than education. But as we see the future of education progressing with much more rapid change and particularly enhanced by technology, um, we need to have leaders that can be more flexible and innovative in their processes, while still maintaining the traditions of conservative, um, the conservative social responsibility of schooling and education to uh, replicate past practices. Um, but that can't be as strong as to inhibit innovative um, processes that are needed for our future society. Okay, so all of those, and then there was a range of what are called tech enablers. And these are the processes that will, the technologies 
that help things happen. And again, lots of different technologies were considered, 3D printing, artificial intelligence, blended learning, crowdsourcing, uh, portfolios, lots and lots of technologies. That was only a small snippet, there were over 50 at least. What do you think are going to be the most significant or the most significant technology that will change education the most in the next five years? So think about all the different technologies we've been talking about during this course. Um, some of the ones you've come across yourselves. What do you think will be the ones that have the most significant impact? And from the um, Delphi study that the board undertook, the most important ones for schools were digital collaborative platforms, basically tools that allow students and teachers and school organizations to work together, tools for privacy and safety online, analytic and adaptive technologies, cloud infrastructure, and mobile devices. And in terms of worldwide adoption, mobile devices were considered uh, probably the most significant one. And for the advisory board individually in their own schools, they saw blended learning tools as a significant factor, along with mobile devices, the digital environment that was created within the school, digital collaborative platforms, and tools for privacy and safety online. So let's look at what some of these things mean. So digital collaborative platforms are digital spaces and tools that enable local and global collaboration. And this includes all the video conferencing platforms, but also other tools um, such as learning management systems and other systems that help us work together. Now, again, this was pre-pandemic just, but at, even at that stage, this was seen as one of the most significant factors that was influencing education. But the other big thing that's concerning educators um, globally is around making sure that students are safe and that their data and um, their, their, their data is, is um, private and that it's not exploited. And there's a range of different technologies and tools, particularly around filtering and uh, monitoring tools that have been emerging to assist with that. Now, they went on the back burner during the pandemic as we had to open up much more widely than was anticipated. But now that that's out of the way, we're again seeing more focus on ensuring that our students are um, safe from external influence online and also that their data is protected. And again, as I talked about before, that's an ongoing issue of considerable debate and concern. Analytics and adaptive tech has been very big at, in the university sector, particularly around trying to make predictions about which students will drop out and being able to put in place intervention programs to um, reduce those dropout rates. But there's a whole range of other different processes that are being incorporated to support in the customization of learning um, so that we can analyze students' data. Um, some of that for the organizational's benefit, so knowing where to invest in teaching staff and in um, additional curriculum focus. Um, in Australia, it's mostly been around literacy and numeracy because we've had national testing around those processes. Uh, we haven't had national testing around other processes such as the arts or health and PE. So there's no data to support emphasis on those. So we haven't had an, um, a lot of focus on that. So hopefully there'll be a broader um, examination of what is collected and we can have a more nuanced um, investment of energies across a range of elements. But unfortunately we can bias our research by choosing what is measured um, what is research, what is explored, and that can then inform subsequent decisions. Now, the cloud, inf cloud infrastructure has been expanding, um, led by a major 
tech industries um, where most of our desktop applications are moving now to um, online versions. Um, and indeed, there's now talk about the operating system also moving online. Um, so whereas 15 years ago, the idea that we would be able to edit video or edit images online would have been fanciful. We had to have dedicated computers and um, desktop software to be able to do any of that. Uh, all of those things can now be done over the cloud um, using online services. And increasingly, um, the tech industry is moving towards that because they can have much more control over their uh, financing models, whereby they can have a leasing or a, um, a hiring process rather than a sales process of software. Um, so you'll find that you'll subscribe to various software and indeed various operating systems and other tools and services rather than purchase once off. Um, and that has a big implication for schools. Um, so now many schools are coming to grips with that and are moving towards this and being able to build that into their budgets. But in the past, they were able to purchase once and then have that last for a number of years. And often schools would extend the life of such purchases well beyond what was industry norm. And schools would be using um, software twice as long as most other industries. Um, schools can't do that now under a more subscription-based model. Of course, educational technology companies are making some allowances for that in allowing schools to have educational pricing so they can still support teachers and students in utilizing those, those software and services um, without destroying the school's budgets. But every year, the, the amount of money that's allocated towards technology in schools has been increasing. Um, it's certainly uh, the second behind staffing costs now. Um, and there's no evidence that it's going to decrease anytime soon. So that's a consideration that needs to be taken into account long term. And again, it's a trend that could be considered in education. What happens when most of our educational budgets is spent on technology versus staff? Um, will the technology be able to replace staff commensurate to the investment that's required in the technology? Can we choose not to invest in the technology or are we now trapped within a technology um, investment cycle. These are a range of different things that can be considered around educational technology and the future in terms of forecasting. Now, mobile devices have been taking the world by storm, um, particularly globally. Uh, in many developed countries where they don't have the infrastructure that we have in the West, mobile devices, because they can be the infrastructure to support them can be easily um, developed, whereas wired-based um, infrastructure uh, requires a huge upfront um, investment. Um, mobile towers can be rolled out as the demand increases um, much more easily and more effectively. But a lot of our um, resources in education haven't been necessarily tailored for um, access via mobile phones. Uh, we've tended to focus on desktops and laptops and to a lesser extent tablets. But that's um, changing, particularly as the demand has increased in uh, developing world for access to online textbooks and resources that can be um, provided via a small device. Okay, so that was that report. Um, the Horizon Report, which we'll go through a little bit more quickly, has also um, looked at various trends. And this one looks at um, higher education and the various trends that are occurring around adaptive technologies and emerging technologies and the economic trends. So I provide that for you to read and look at these various trends that are occurring. Um, it identified three main social trends being around well-being and mental health, demographic changes and equity and fair practices. Technological trends being around artificial intelligence, 
um, next generation digital learning environments, which are improvements to our learning management systems, and analytics and privacy questions. And then there were the economic trends, the cost of higher education, um, which is a particularly significant one in the United States where um, tuition fees are um, going up and up every year. Uh, the future of work and skills in terms of what needs to be achieved by higher education in preparing students for um, employment and also climate change and how that may affect higher education. So quite different issues to what's being focused on in K-12 schooling, but some of them will obviously also have an impact. So some of the issues facing higher education around changes in student population, um, where in particular, where higher education is, is focusing much more on mature age students, those coming back from the workforce for re-education rather than on school leavers. A lot more alternative pathways into higher education. So it's not just having to go through um, high school and get a, a score that then ranks you and allows you access into higher education. There's now many, many different pathways of doing um, other courses, um, experience in industry, and then coming into higher education through various other means. And also the whole nature of online education. And again, as we saw a huge proliferation of this during the pandemic, it's now a big focus around how we can do things differently in higher education. There's also political issues facing higher education. Um, generally, once upon a time, higher education was seen as a national good and an economic driver. And so governments invested heavily in higher education. And indeed, in some European countries, that's continuing to be the case, and in some cases, even increasing, where they have free tuition and so forth. In many other countries, Australia included, higher education um, investment has been decreasing, and it's more and more being left to industry and for individual students to support the cost of higher education. The value of higher education is also being questioned. Once upon a time, it was sort of guaranteed pathway into employment. If you got your degree, you would pretty much be guaranteed into a particular pathway. Um, that's not necessarily the case anymore. And so with other pathways into employment, particularly in the tech industry, which sort of led a big sort of focus around this, um, the need for a higher education qualification is not always necessary. And then there's also political polarization where different political parties take different views and that can have an impact upon um, their support for higher education. So in terms of the university sector, what do you think will be the most significant trend having an impact upon higher education? And pop that into Teams. Okay, so again, just going through this was the 130 technologies and practices that were explored as part of this particular report. So lots and lots of different um, technologies and they identified a set of significant ones that they put into this particular um, infographic, uh, particularly around artificial intelligence and virtual reality. They were probably the two biggest um, technological um, trends but also open educational resources. The idea of having um, coursework material made freely available for anyone to be able to use. Okay, so all of this allows us to explore the future in different ways. We've got all of these data and trends that we can make predictions upon. And from that, we develop scenarios about what the future may be like. Now, this particular report puts forward four possible futures for post for tertiary um, teaching and learning. And they look at, firstly, one of growth, where higher education increases and grows and um, sort of the ideal perspective from a higher education traditional um, understanding. The next perspective is around constraint, where things will get 
um, tougher, but there won't be any sort of collapse. Um, might be a little bit smaller in terms of universities, less funding, less opportunities to do things, but still staying within what was expected, just not as strongly um, positive as it could have been. The next is then collapse, where higher education is seen no longer as fit for purpose. And we see industry bodies and industry groups and other um, online service providers and so forth take over the role of higher education. Um, so in, in schooling, we would have education departments run teacher education programs within their own uh, departments and things of that nature, um, which is on the agenda. So that is a possibility, but it's not necessarily the most likely possibility. And the fourth possible outcome, fourth possible scenario, would be around transformation, where we see a total reorganization of how higher education is done um, to allow much more personalized learning, maybe with individual tutors um, and various um, on-the-job training processes, completely different to how we do things now. So think about in terms of your own scenario writing, what would be some of the inputs that you would take from these ideas into your own scenarios? So you're going to be thinking about um, the scenarios you're going to generate. You're going to need to take various trends that lead to those. But some of these ideas from these existing scenarios and from these reports can also inform where your scenarios go. Um, they all have data supporting them. The reports themselves represent a data source. So while you may not have numerical data that shows a, a graph line, you can say that this was reported in this report and that provides some indication that it may occur. Not quite as strong as if you've got some nice graph based trend data, but it is still an indicator. Particularly if you can find a number of reports that can support saying that this is likely to happen. Okay, so from this report then, they then created their scenarios, or they call them implications essays, um, and looked at the different, the four different possible scenarios and what implications that would have to education. Now, you don't need to do implication essays for your assignment, um, but I just present this because it's a way that they unpacked their scenarios um, so that they could explore individual elements in a bit more detail. So have a read through those implication scenarios or implication exa examples. Now the final report is an Australian one. Um, this was done a few years ago and looked at the range of educational technology trends in K-12 education in Australia. Uh, so again, we had about 50 um, experts and they conducted a Delphi study um, and went through and explored what might occur over the next, I think we look at 10 years for this one. So there are a range of educational technologies that were considered most significant. Uh, the first being digital presentations, use of um, PowerPoint and digital projectors and so forth within schools. The rise of maker spaces, um, cloud computing, flexible learning spaces, and learning management systems. And again, they were all developed from various trends. Oops. Oh, let's push on. And there were a range of aspects that also looked at the curriculum. And these were identified as the five most significant changes that were needed in teaching about digital technologies. The first was more of a focus on robotics. Uh, second on online activities and the students using online activities to support their learning. The teaching about programming languages, uh, a greater focus on digital citizenship and online responsibility and safety and things of those nature. And more about information systems, about how to access data, how students own data was contained within many information systems, um, how they could find out things about the world from information systems, from data bases and so forth. Okay, 
From that then was identified a range of challenges. Professional learning for teachers was considered a big challenge. Uh, the development of higher order thinking skills in students and teaching teachers how to uh, develop higher order thinking skills in students. The resistance to change and getting, student, getting teachers and students to embrace change and to engage with change. The expanding roles of teachers and school leaders where more and more is being asked of teachers every year. Um, being able to take on social, social, um, social worker roles, uh, psychologist roles, counselling roles, whole range of additional things, but also now data, data analysis, analysis roles. Um, every year, more and more is being asked of teachers, um, which means less and less focus on core business around teaching and learning. And the final challenge was around teacher professionalism, where teaching was still very much considered a trade in many areas, particularly by some of the larger de departmental institutionals, institutionalized um, schooling systems, where professional development is provided for teachers rather than teachers taking personal responsibility for their own ongoing learning. Okay. And then finally, there were a range of challenges that were identified around funding um, to support these various aspects, collaboration, being able to teach and schools working collaboratively, uh, project-based learning being not well supported within schooling systems, deep learning, particularly around 20 and 21st century skills, not being well developed and supported in our schooling systems. So again, I commend that report for you to look at and to explore another set of data that you can use in coming up with your own um, forecast and scenarios. So finally, just looking at the idea of forecasting again, where we use it to make predictions about the future based upon trend analysis, um, using historical data or the results of expert opinions. And in your case, these reports can form expert opinions that you can use to support arguments around different forecasts you may wish to make about the future. The preferred future that you wish to see happen and the scenarios around how that may come into place and the stages that will be needed to get there. We don't just jump straight to a preferred future. There will often be a range of steps that are needed in order to achieve that. And last week we looked at futures wheels where we can use that, that structure of a futures wheel to set into place the various things that we're interested in, in terms of looking at their trends, looking at how they may interact with each other um, a few years into the future. Then as a result of those interactions, how that they may, may then uh, forecast into um, an additional stage further into the future. So in terms of the nature of forecasts, they should always be plausible. There should be a logical connection. Um, even though it might be possible, it still needs to be a plausible. So having aliens turn up and then teach us all through ESP and um, direct brain transfer and all the rest might be a remote possibility. It's not necessarily a plausible one. Um, that said, though, the impact of global climate change, um, greater and greater temperature, temperature fluctuations, they're reasonably plausible, and they could be things that you could consider around changes in education. They need to be relevant. So the, the trends that you explore and the forecasts you make need to have some impact upon education. Um, they can't just, be, can't just go and um, start talking about uh, the effects that will have on penguins in Antarctica. Uh, while various climate change things obviously will have an impact upon um, wildlife in Antarctica, it's not particularly relevant for our focus on education and on the trends that are going to impact upon education. They should be divergent. Everything shouldn't all be focused around one thing. You should be looking at a whole range of different aspects and then explore how those things interact with one another. Um, 
but not so much so that they all just converge into one idea so that you're only looking at virtual reality, for example. Look at a whole range of different aspects of the future, um, some around technology, some around challenges, some around um, accelerators or opportunities. And finally, your forecasts should be challenging. They shouldn't just be based on what we've always done. You should try to challenge some of our assumptions and our preconceptions and try to think about doing things differently. So one other thing we can do once we have forecasts is we can start looking at how we can try to be better make them come about. And we call this backcasting. So once we have a vision of the future, a scenario of the future that we would like to see occur, it's often useful to go back and look at what are all the things that are going to be needed to see that future come about. And we call this backcasting. And it can then help us with our forecasts by highlighting things that we might not have thought about. So if the forecast sort of set us down one particular perspective, backcasting can allow us to look at things a little bit more openly and hopefully then advance the scenario writing and the forecasts we make and where our efforts need to be directed in order to see the preferred future come about. So have a look at that again. Um, you don't need to do backcasting for your assignment, but it's again an aspect of future studies that is particularly important when you're looking at a um, organization. So if you're looking at what's going to be needed for a school, let's say we want to improve student um, assessment outcomes. Yes, it's fine to say that and we can look at various forecasts of we could use a learning management system, we could use virtual reality uh, that might help them with their learning. But once we then get to that uh, final scenario, what we want to see the, the school look like, and we want to see all of these students coming out with top scores, is virtual reality and learning management systems going to be uh, all that's necessary to achieve that? Most likely not. What are the other things that would be needed to help us get to there? And that's when you can use backcasting to explore things in more depth than just what the forecast may have led you to. So finally, we then have the scenario writing, where you write your scenarios about the future. Now, it's usual in scenario writing to create what's called the best case, the worst case, and the most likely case. And that's usually between the best and worst cases. And it will often also end up being our preferred future. Um, now, while ideally the preferred future would be the best case, what we would I with the ultimate, if everything worked out well, we need to be a little bit pragmatic and understand that things aren't always going to turn out absolutely wonderfully. Um, and that's where generally most of our effort tends to focus on the most likely case. That said, there are visionaries that do look at the best case and talked about this last week in terms of the various tech companies um, where they have their uh, visioning labs where they look at um, what might happen. Uh, and we've got various companies looking at the future of artificial intelligence and human um, long longevity. Uh, Self-driving cars was once a visionary project. So there are groups that are looking at those because some of them can come about. Um, but you don't want to bet all of your money on the high risk um, opportunities, even though they may lead to the greatest um, outcomes, there still needs to be some responsibility in decision making overall. Okay. So the last concept to look at is what's called emerging issues analysis. And this is where we look at those high risk um, options and consider whether or not it actually is worthwhile going for those um, ones that will provide the the big the big payoffs um, and particularly where the more conservative approaches 
haven't achieved much traction over many years. It may then be time to try some more radical perspectives. Um, but in other cases where the conservative options are generally doing things quite well, then it may make more sense to just go for an incremental advancement. With we do have difficulties, that's where the more risky options become more um, arguable. Okay, so that's given you hopefully some food for thought around your own scenario development and some material in which to support your forecasts. And I look forward to discussing these further in our tutorials.